Pavilion. So if you are joining us virtually but plan to come to the Blue Zone later this week, you can find us uh, in the SEC Center um, just behind the Australia Pavilion. If you're not with us uh, here in Glasgow, then um, you'll hear a little bit of background noise as we uh, are, are coming to you live. And um, as a hybrid event, we're going to, to do our best to uh, really make sure that you'll be able to participate in the discussion. And Harriet will um, take you through a little bit in a, in a few minutes how to participate and submit your own questions so we can be sure that everyone is engaged here. Um, I'm going to hand the floor now to uh, Harriet Lamb, who is the CEO of Ashton, and who will be moderating and steering the discussion here today. I'll leave it to Harriet as well to speak a little bit about who Ashton is and what they do. So Harriet, over to you. Thank you so much and good afternoon or good morning. Good evening, everybody, both here in the room and around the world. Uh, I should say, just to add to the good reasons to come to this pavilion, is there's a really nice coffee shop just outside. So if you're wondering where to go and have a quiet moment, if you do come to the Blue Zone, I absolutely recommend coming here. And congratulations, really, to the Global Wind Energy Council for hosting this event that is really looking at how can we better engage communities. Sometimes in these big global climate talks, it can all disappear up a bit into the stratosphere. And I'm really thrilled that for the next hour, we'll have the chance to really talk about how to engage communities in renewable energy. Uh, and particularly important given our theme is participation. We really want to make this session as participatory as possible. So I'm really relying on all of you online and in the room to be sure to submit your questions. I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves in a minute. I've got some questions to kick us off, but then I'm really looking for your questions, both submitted online and in the room to help really uh, dig down a bit and go beyond the platitudes uh, on this absolutely vital discussion. Uh, so as you said, I'm Harriet Lamb. Um, I lead Ashton, which is a charity uh, based in the UK, but working also in the developing world focusing on climate solutions. And a lot of what we've done is absolutely around renewable energy, but is also about those companies, those initiatives who have found ways to engage communities in their work. And I think we would all agree that we're only going to make this transition to renewable energy if it is also a just transition that engages and inspires people and where they see the benefits of moving to that greener future. So who better to help us dig into this topic than our lovely panel? Uh, so, um, and I'm going to ask them to, uh, each of them, one by one, to kick off by uh, introducing themselves and um, letting us all know, sitting uh, where you are, Gabriel, sitting in Austria, let us know who you are, the work you do at Bachmann, but also what's been for you one high and perhaps one low from the COP26 so far. Hello to Lesko, uh, here from Austria. My name is Gabriel Schwanzer. I'm the head of marketing and sales and director of wind energy, the business unit wind energy in Bachmann Electronic. Maybe you know, you know Bachmann Electronic uh, is uh, in the automation system. That means producing, developing automation, automation systems special for, for the wind energy. We are now in the business for more than 20 years. And around about uh, more than 120 wind turbines are equipped with the automation system. That means with the main controller. And we also monitor, observe more than 10,000 turbines worldwide with, uh, in our monitoring center. So that means to just to provide the wind energy to, uh, to make wind energy for, uh, more effective and, and of course more cheaper to have more acceptance. So as I know, uh, so the positive for me in the, in, uh, in the COP26, uh, I think it's an engagement of all the people, uh, all the people and of course also all the association like the GVEC, for instance, to have this panel session, to have uh, a lot of meeting to inform people more about uh, renewable energy, about wind energy. I think that's really, really important. Hope we'll talk about this later on. And uh, the negative thing for me is, I think the, the, the interest of the national information, that means uh, it's just here in Austria, maybe in the TV, 
we see at least one minute per day. Uh, we, are, we hear about this, this very, very important session there at the COP26 in Glasgow. And then we, we switch over to the COVID topics. And then it takes more than 15 hours to this. Of course, it's also important. But I think it's also one of, of the topics we have to discuss. Maybe we have to discuss today uh, how we can, we can improve all this, this kind of information uh, in, in general. Yeah, thanks, Gabriel. And I think that's, you've put your finger on one of the issues it would be great to discuss more, isn't it? How can we communicate better directly with communities affected, but also more widely to impact the national and international framework? So moving on, and um, we've got a very unusual guest here today. I'm rather jealous, actually. We do have, and I don't know if you can see online, the lovely little um, pink octopus who has joined us, obviously sitting next to Zoiza. So tell us, Zoiza, about what you do. I will. I'll firstly introduce my furry friend. So this is Constantine. He's the uh, mascot of our company, which is very aptly named um, Octopus Energy. So um, Octopus Energy is a energy tech disruptor. Um, so we supply um, directly 3 million customers around the world in six countries. And our technology also supports a further 17 million. So we work with some of the biggest utilities now in the world um, who license that platform. Um, so people like um, E.ON and recently EDF actually just last week. Um, I run the um, generation arm of Octopus Energy, and um, we have a portfolio of about three gigawatts of renewable energy projects. Um, so that supplies, I think, just around two and a half million uh, customers. Um, it also has, um, in terms of wind in our portfolio, about 30 wind farms across six countries. Um, so in terms of uh, highs and lows of COP, which I think was the, um, mm. the question you wanted yes, us please, to answer. Yes. Um, uh, just one of each. Just one of each. <laughs> I was going to say, well, I think highs actually um, are quite similar to Gabriel. It's to do with um, this ability to now see people in the flesh and I think talk um, face to face. Um, and it does bring this um, kind of momentum um, that perhaps you don't get sitting on a Zoom call. Um, it's, it's all of the ability to actually network outside the COP as well um, and the conversations that have been created on the fringes um, I think are the ones that really form the action. Um, in terms of lows um, I would say I probably always say this in life just disappointed with the speed um, and um, not really delivering quickly enough and I had really high hopes being honest um, coming in because I look at what um, here in the UK but across the world we've achieved with things like the vaccine program um, and how um, you know in 18 months um, we've managed to vaccinate I know it's 85 million at last count here in the UK and countless around the world um, it's something that happened really really rapidly and I cannot help but think that if we had the same approach in um, ridding things like fossil fuels from the mix, when you look at actually how long it takes to develop and connect wind farms, um, we could have actually gone much, much faster. So for me, this is um, this is really about speed. I think you put your finger there on another challenge I hope we can discuss between the need to move really fast. And on the other hand, that's often very difficult to take communities with you if you go very fast. Mm. So I hope we can come back to that later in the discussion. But for now, let's go over to Ghana. Hello, Chibize Ezekiel. Great to have you with us. Um, would you like to tell us about the work you do at the uh, Strategic Youth Network for Development and tell us one of your one high, one low of how COP looks like sitting in Ghana? Well, um, thank you, Elena, and uh, hello to everybody. Um, so my name is Chibize Ezekiel, and I work with the Strategic Youth Network for Development. Um, so basically what we do is that we try to influence environmental policies from the youth perspective. Um, having been able to shut down government's intention to build a coal plant, we are now promoting more of renewable energy as better alternatives. So that's what we do in Ghana, championing renewable energy as a better alternative as compared to fossil fuel or coal that our government planned to build in the past. Um, in terms of my high, one high, um, I would say that this year's hybrid um, session has been very uh, good. Um, I think for the first time we have the government of Ghana streaming, you know, our pavilion activities for us in Ghana to also follow. Uh, so for me, the participation is very high, both in person and also online. So at least people are able to follow the conversations happening at COP. 
in terms of my law, um, I want to also agree with my uh, colleague panelists that you know um, we're not. I'm not seeing uh, much, if you like, action. I'm not ambitious action. Um, things are seems, things is, seem to be moving very slowly. You know, we're not seeing much enthusiasm from the global north. You know, to commit to some of the commitments they've made in the past. So that has been my 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 low point. Hopefully. We should hear some good news before COP ends on the 12th. Uh, that is so far what I'm hoping, you know, that at least before we leave COP this year, we want to see something ambitious, you know, for our leaders. Thank you. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right to put your finger there on the gap between the exciting, ambitious commitments and the delivery. Will there be delivery given all that's happened with previous commitments and in particular the 100 billion that was promised every year to developing countries? So I think that's going to be the key, isn't it? what happens after to all the commitments being made now. And so our last member of the panel is Neil Douglas. I don't think you're sitting in the middle of the ocean, even uh, though you've no. got a lovely background. No, <laughs> where, where are you, Neil? I, I'm in Stirling, which is about 45 minutes away from Glasgow, so not, not very far away at all. And tell us, tell us about the work you do at BDG and tell us what you see as one high, one low from COP so far. Certainly. Thank you, Harry. And, uh, and thank you to GWEC for the opportunity to join the panel today. Uh, so BVG Associates, uh, we are a strategy consultants to the wind industry. Um, and the, the work that we do is quite wide ranging, but probably is what is of most relevance here is that we help governments um, in established offshore wind markets and in emerging uh, wind markets to develop policy frameworks. So, for example, we work with the World Bank to develop, uh, we, we produced a roadmap for offshore wind in Vietnam, which is a very promising market for offshore wind. Um, we're currently doing likewise in the Philippines and, and Azerbaijan and, and some other places. Um, so, yes, enabling the offshore wind industry is, is largely what we do. Um, so, for me so far, uh, the 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 high point for COP um, were the marches at the weekend. I thought the youth march on Friday was, was quite inspirational, incredible to see that number of young people out on the street. Um, and then the, the, the main march on, on Saturday. So, so very much that sort of community and, and um, the participation of society. Um, for me, the lows, I'm, I'm withholding judgment just at the moment. Um, you know, there's a report that came out just today uh, that looks at the implementation of the various pledges and targets and, and action plans that have been put in place. And if they are all implemented entirely, um, then we might be coming away from this COP with a, um, on, on track for the 1.8 degree rise, which is not quite the 1.5 degree, which is the target that the, that the COP has set itself. Um, but the worst case is, is getting on for three degrees uh, temperature rise. Um, so that's the big gap. Um, and I hope by the end of the week that we see some serious action towards closing that. Mm. Thanks, Neil. And I love the fact you highlighted pe the strength of feeling among the public, actually, that they're mm. ready to get out there and march. And it was, by the way, pouring with rain and freezing cold in Glasgow. <laughs> but they still went out there and they marched because they care so much about climate action. Uh, and then I guess that takes us exactly to the point about how do we also take people with us when we start to implement the solutions? Because the solutions are not always as popular and they often meet uh, a lot of opposition, whether it's to uh, building uh, on or offshore wind or whether actually it's low traffic neighbourhoods. People often end up opposing the solutions. So um, I want to go to that as our first question, which is also being touched upon by the first question sent in that public acceptance is often the biggest barrier to wind development. And so how can early community engagement help overcome some of those challenges? And in particular, can you give, perhaps each of you could give a concrete example of a method you used or an example of something you were going to do and then you changed it because of community feedback and as a result, it was really successful. Um, so who's going to kick us off? Zoiza, why don't you? I'd be very happy to. 
Um, so yes, in terms of kind of engaging communities and early in the process, um, I mean, what we're found, finding, um, and I, I've got a bit of a confession to make, because of course we're a business that's new, we're, we're five years old. Um, we went into the generation space actually earlier this year. Uh, we've grown very quickly. And one of our kind of, um, I suppose, ethoses is not falling into the same old traps because it's the way that it's always been done. So um, the way that we actually look at creating new wind and solar projects now because of lessons from 10 decades ago with communities just not being engaged and actually being one of the biggest factors that stop certainly the rollout of renewables here and in Europe um, was that we were going to put them in places where people actually want them. So, um, I mean, today we, we launched um, something actually called the Fan Club um, and the mass scaling up of this project. Um, and this is where we actually have our customers coming to us with a greenfield pipeline and driving and saying that we want wind turbines on our doorstep. And the reason why they want wind turbines on the doorstep is because actually we're offering the fact that they will get cheaper energy. So in certain postcode areas, if they're close by, they get an immediate discount, 20% off their energy bills. And then when the wind is blowing above a certain wind speed, so I think it's about 16, 17 miles an hour, they get as much as 17, uh, sorry, 50% off of their energy bills. So very, very big reductions in energy. Now, the reason we can do that is because we have the technology to do so, but we also send price signals to those customers to say, actually, the wind is turning. There's lots of an abundance of electrons on the grid. Charge your car, do your washing now, and you will get really very cheap energy prices. Um, so we are being driven by customers to create the pipeline in the first place. We're putting them where customers want them. And then at the end of it, they're really seeing real benefits which are not you know, necessarily pots of money if we've done in the past where you gave community benefit funds and then cause further division about how that was spent, but actually creating real tangible, lower cost green energy. And I think that's the way that we see we need to build into the future to do this at speed. Brilliant examples there. And I, I think you might be getting emails from people thinking, mm, can I be in the pipeline, in the green pipeline? Um, Neil, what about you? Do you have some concrete examples of methods that have really worked to engage communities? Yes, yeah, certainly. Thank you. So I mean, I've, I've been involved in, pr prior to working more in the sort of consultancy that I, that I work for now, I was involved in project development. So onshore and offshore wind farm development um, globally, but predominantly in, in the UK and within that predominantly in, in Scotland. Um, and and what, what we've seen with with wind energy as a whole, as a technology as a whole, is that, you know, universally opinion polls have been run by various organisations, by industry, by government and so on, that, that show that wind energy is a popular form of energy. 70-80% of people will, will support wind energy in a general sense, and that usually broadly translates into support for, for individual projects, but that's not to ignore specific impacts that you can see at community level and at a project level. And of course, those, those impacts might cover a very broad range of things. It, it might be about visual amenity. It might be worries about noise impact. It might be about disturbance to, to leisure and recreation facilities and so on. Or it might be around environmental impacts, habitats and species and so on. Um, and, and the other sort of uh, aspect there is people concerned about their impact on on livelihoods, fishing communities, quite quite reasonably asking about what's the impact of a large offshore wind farm on on fishing grounds and 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 their livelihoods and so on. So so it's it's a it's a broad it's a broad spectrum, and I don't think there's there's necessarily one size fits all. Um, some some very positive uh, outcomes I've seen is where there's been a tangible economic benefit. Now, sometimes that's through community benefit funds, as, as has just been mentioned by Joyce. Um, but where employment is created, we see a very particular reaction from, uh, from the community. Now, onshore wind farms aren't actually massive employers in terms of lots of people being employed on the wind farm. Um, you know, a lot of the, the, the servicing happens by, is done by mobile uh, workforces that go around wind farms in a particular region. There might be a few people employed full time um, on the project. 
but where that does happen, it's very often in rural areas where, where there might already be employment difficulties. Um, I've seen some really nice examples of people that have that have moved over from, from other industries. And, and this is a theme that we might come back to around the just transition from, from existing energy sources to, to, to renewables. Um, so I, I've I've worked with people who used to work for uh, within the utilities entirely within their coal and gas portfolio, um, and now they're the biggest evangelists for wind energy that that you're likely to meet, and uh, mm. so they've made that transition within that utility from from one technology to the other. That's um, a great mm-hmm. example. If it's okay, Neil, I just move on now to sure. help to bring in the others. But I, as you say, I I, I hope we can come back to that because. Mm. That's one of the keys, is isn't it? If people are going to lose jobs within fossil fuels, Absolutely. can they can they see jobs for themselves in the renewable sector? But uh, Jabezi, I wanted to ask you um, if you had some concrete examples. We've had some really brilliant uh, building up of different examples so far about community engagement. Have you got other different examples to add to that? Um, thank you once again. Um, so let me, in the interest of time, I'll just limit myself to one example, which is our cold campaign, or anti cold campaign, which was well executed. Um, one thing I've observed is that usually we engage, we use or we focus on community people as an afterthought. You know, we don't engage them from the initial stage throughout the process from implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. So they feel, you know, that they are being marginalized that they are not being engaged in the process so they start agitating you know when they feel that they are not being involved in the process so for us you know in terms of our experience when it came to anti cool campaign one of the things we did was that we actually went into the community spent about three or four days with the people in the community talking to the chiefs the elders the women groups the youth groups want to understand whether they have adequate information on the coal plant that government intends to build and then we now use our advocacy skills to engage them to, you know, let them understand the adverse impact of coal on their lives if they should allow the coal plant to be built in the community. So again, that actually fostered our strong relationship with the community members. Therefore, they realized that we are a strong force that they can rely on, that they can depend on to speak on their behalf. So I think that um, one of the resistance, you know, if you ask me, is because one, they feel that they are not being taken seriously. But once you go to them, you spend time with them, get their issues, you know, because one key example is that usually when it comes to some of these projects, some may end up losing their land, you know, if you want to build, uh, uh, you know, a wind energy or the turbine, etc. How do you compensate them? You know, what are the mitigation plans? So you tell them through the process, you know, for them to appreciate that indeed, okay, our needs have been considered. But if you believe because you are a government or you're a private sector, you have the resources, you have the power, and then if you want to, you know, take control without considering them, over time, they start agitating and start confronting you, you know, on the project. So I think that per our experience, it is always important to engage them for the onset and let them appreciate the benefit of the project, even to them as committee members. And once you do that, you are able to get them, you know, to support your projects. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you very much. And I, I really like the focus you put on involving existing leadership or existing community groups and working through them to reach out to people in different communities. Um, Before I come to Gabriel on the same question, just to remind you all, uh, whether you're in the room or online, do please uh, send in your questions so we can put them to the panel. Um, And um, meanwhile, coming to you, Gabriel, what's your most concrete example of where you think an, a wind project has succeeded in winning the support of the community? Yeah, you know, you know as a supplier, we are not really in, in relation or in touch with the communities, but uh, uh, just my ideas of, or what I see more or less as also as a private person, I would just to pick up one, one of the topics I, I explain or try to explain I pointed out in the introduction. I think it's it's a kind of um, information. So I think, in my opinion, there's already a lot of information and reports about renewable energy in, in the wind industry, but it's primarily provided to specialist audiences or lecturers there where the people present don't need to be convinced because they are already in the in the in the business and mostly mostly of them are already informed very well. So far, I've seen less information about the general public, which is not in touch with all the technologies and topics in wind energy. So 
And if they are, they are very focused on the opinion of maybe of some publisher or often polarized. So I think, uh, yeah, we have to we have to say a little more about more positively about the, the green energy and the wind energy. So you know, wind uh, energy rises the standard of living of communities and providing secure jobs uh, for skilled labor needed and job security. And, and of course, also in the community, wind energy simply does not worsen the pollution like fossil fuels. We said, I think one way to inform communities and the wider population is through campaigns by using TV, radio, social media channels. And it's very important, as we heard before, uh, local in-person presentation. I think such campaign must be carried out with a high frequency in order to be effective. Uh, not everything should be glorified, of course, but it should be shown in real terms, how wind energy is generated, what the state of the development of modern wind turbines is, and critical aspect, aspect should also be pointed out. I think this is a type of serious and well-balanced information we give to the public more. We give the public more confidence in, in the benefits of, of wind energy. Mm. Really so, interesting. Gosh, so thank you so much. You've all given very different perspectives on, on what we need to do to take communities with us. Um, and I'd like to now move to the first question from the audience. Um, if you say it, take off your mask and say it loudly, I will then repeat it so the audience um, online can hear your question. And I just want to check, Joyce, um, uh, are we? Is it, are you happy if everyone tweets about this event while it's running? If you would like to, then take the words of wisdom of our amazing panel and tweet out about it, please do. So over to our first question. You can project, and then I'm going to repeat it. Yeah. Come here and stand there. The camera can see you. Otherwise, they're looking at a blank box. If you just stand there while you are just there while you ask your question. Yes, so Matthew Hannah Strathclyde is sort of for me one of the most powerful ways of empowering communities is through community ownership. Um, and there's there are big question marks about how we can uh, integrate that in, in the wind power sector in the UK. We're probably a little bit behind some of the other countries in Europe, uh, Scandinavia, Germany, where cooperative ownership is, is mm -hmm. commonplace. But we do have many success stories in the UK of wind power, particularly onshore. So the question to the panel is, how integral is community ownership to empowering local communities? Is it essential? And I point to one particular um, piece of work. I'm not going to remember all this, you know. You realise I've got to repeat it. <laughs> What, what one particular piece of work from Aquaterra, which I'm sure Neil is, is familiar with, community-owned wind projects delivered 34 times more money and community benefit than the commercially-owned ones. So do we require community ownership to empower communities Where for wind power? That, Aqua, uh, that was uh, UK projects. Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, a brilliant question. Who wants to go first on community ownership? Yep, Zoiza's putting up her hand. So, and then Neil. Off you go. I totally agree. I think um, actually here in the UK specifically, we're woefully behind on offering um, ownership of from communities. I think one of the things that's probably held it back is um, actually to really get scale and to go quickly. I think that for whatever reason, the community energy um, isn't packaged um, appropriately. Um, it seems to feel like uh, when we talk to our customers that community energy is for certain people, it's not for everybody. Um, and it seems to be, um, a, a, for whatever reason, rightly or wrongly, um, a white middle-class activity, it's not something that's all-encompassing. Um, what we are finding, um, so with our collective, which we've launched today, we will be bringing together the power of just people being able to invest. So they will have that ability, but wrapping that in with institutional money as well, so that um, actually together we can create one pot, which is called the collective, to create these projects which are built as i said driven by people because they're requesting them and actually offering them um, cheaper energy um, but to do that we have to work of course with existing community groups um, we need to make it way more diverse and we need to start making it really resonate with more people and i think we'll be able to go much faster mm. 
Well, one great example uh, here in the UK of that is a community energy group called Repowering. And I know they're speaking on a panel later this week who work in an area of London that is deprived and with a very high BAME community. Uh, and they've generated their funds locally to put solar panels on social housing, but also key, and I think it goes back to the points that Gabriel and Neil were raising, they trained local young people in the skills around solar panels. So they're all offering them properly paid apprenticeships so that they could also see uh, jobs and learn skills along the way. Um, but Neil, I think you had your hand up about... Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. certainly, Harriet, thank you. Yeah, listen, community ownership of, of wind, and I'll, I'll talk maybe more specifically about onshore wind here, is, has, you know, it's been looked at for, for a long time, and we've had a certain amount of success um, with projects that are owned by community groups. So they tend to be smaller projects, individual wind turbines, or sometimes it's a biomass project or uh, a district heating project um, within sort of constituted community groups, and, 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 but they tend to be relatively small. The trick that we've yet to really pull off is getting community ownership into large utility scale mm. wind farms. You know, there, there's various models emerging, and I'm very interested to hear about what Octopus are proposing. Um, there's a crowd source, a crowdfunding platform called Ripple that's that's having great success in terms of getting crowdfunding ownership. But again, did I say it? Those tend to be um, those crowdfunding platforms are for those people that can afford to invest. Um, very often, we're talking about rural communities, and and for a community to take on the costs and the liabilities of of part ownership of a project takes a very particular commercial model to, to make that work. And we've not seen that happen, you know, that model emerge that, that's replicated across multiple projects. I have no doubt it is possible, but it definitely takes a very engaged and a very informed community group to be the counterparty dealing with what are often, you know, very large multinational utility type companies. Um, you know, with lots of lawyers and big legal departments and all that, that's the reality of the situation. If if a, if a community is talking about taking on ownership, then it has to be very well constituted and, and well organised to take on mm. those sort of risks and liabilities. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I don't know, Chibese, I mean, obviously, Ghana and many African countries have such strong traditions of cooperative working. On the other hand, have you seen that applied in renewable energy yet? Well, um, unfortunately, Ghana is yet to pick up when it comes to renewable energy. We are basically doing less than 1% in terms of our energy mix. Uh, it is something that we are now developing, you know, as a country. Uh, so we still have a long way to go. But that's notwithstanding. I mean, the basic principle is that once you're able to commit the community people, uh, we are guaranteed of sustainability. Uh, we are guaranteed of, you know, the, the project being able to stand on its feet. Um, to avoid any disturbances or, you know, uh, reactions from the community people. So I think that that cooperation or collectiveness or sense of ownership for me is key. It's a key principle we must not shy away from. And one, that's one thing also in terms of context uh, in our part of the world, again, our laws differ, our context differs. For example, in Ghana, we have chiefs who are the custodians of the land. So what they can do is that a company comes and says, okay, I want to invest into your community. I need your support. So the chiefs and the elders can say, okay, as our contribution, that we are offering you this piece of land, you know, as our contribution as a community for this project. So that becomes our contribution to the development of the renewable energy infrastructure. So that becomes a form of ownership or a form of you know collaboration between the community people and the company. So if you ask me, I think that, that issue of ownership is something we must not shy away from. Yeah. Mm. No, really, really interesting. But and, and Gabriel, what about obviously Europe is way ahead of the UK, as Zoiza was saying. Have you got some good examples of community ownership of renewable energy? Yeah, I think there's there's one topic uh, I, I would just uh, mention here. I think in the future, communities will face a challenge also in terms of uh, grid stability and energy supply to the, the this, uh, decentralization of renewable energies. Uh, in my opinion, and uh, from the technological point of view, the solutions are already available, like uh, virtual power plants are relevant and can be implemented. Such virtual power plants are 
real opportunities for uh, such communities in their infrastructure. So security of supply, independence, even uh, the possibility of generating new sources of income can uh, lead the policy in the direction of renewable energy, in my opinion. Uh, already today, communities that work in an energy efficiency way uh, receive special financial support like the E5 uh, certificates. I think such additional funding and support can contribute to Accept, uh, to acceptance and implement uh, implementation in communities. Yeah, going back to the financial structures point then. Um, do please keep putting up your hand if you'd like to ask a question or sending them in. Uh, and we have another one from the room. Come on up. And if you stand here and I give you my mic, I think that will be the easiest. Uh, so there we go. Thanks very much. Hi. Richard Randall Boggess from the University of Sheffield. So Neil mentioned uh, a message of hope that we could potentially achieve 1.8, but that's going to require absolute drastic change. And so uh, in one of the talks yesterday by Bloomberg NER, I might get these numbers wrong, um, but they mentioned that to achieve 1.8, we might need, say, I, I might get the numbers wrong, but five times more wind a year, three times more solar a year, 200,000 more EVs a year. And if you bear in mind that how long it takes to put up a, a wind farm, how can we balance that rate of change that we need to achieve 1.8 um, with achieving the just transition that's required for the transition from fossil fuels? Thank you. Okay, who wants to go first with that one? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take that on. Thank you, Richard, for, for the great question. Um, I mean, you're quite right. The, 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 the volume of renewables that is being talked about as, as part of the net zero planning is, is enormous and that will put strain on land use and, and seabed use. Um, and that's going to require an enormous amount of both community and stakeholder consultation. And by stakeholders, I include communities and businesses and statutory organisations that are responsible for, um, you know, granting consent for, for changes to land use. Um, so there's definitely a question there about the, the, the volume um, and, and how quickly we can respond to that. So it's not just about governments investing in or, or, or committing to the programmes to do this, it's about investing in the government infrastructure that allows it to happen. Um, so so that's, that's definitely an important point. Um, the, could you remind me just the second part of your question, if Richard's still there with his microphone? Coming back. Uh, yeah, it was basically just how do we balance that with the just transition from fossil fuels as well? Basically, we need drastic change, but we also, one of the first things that was mentioned in the introduction is that we can't change too quickly um, yes. or else it won't be a just transition, but also we really need to change really quickly. So how do yeah. we determine that balance? Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 absolutely. And, and, you know, a couple of examples there. There's a big debate raging about domestic heating here in the UK um, and the move away from gas boilers towards heat pumps or wh whatever other technical solution. That, that requires millions of individual decisions to be made individual buying decisions from, from the population and from society as a whole. And we can't expect that just to happen without, without people, you know, understanding the reasoning by, behind it and, and understanding the financial implications. So I think there's a, you know, we've, we've reached the point now where the, the, the environmental agenda is very high in the public consciousness. You know, I think it, it, the, the way it is represented in the media now is very different from even five or 10 years ago. But there's still a huge way to go in terms of, of education and, and, and that not just being a, 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 a unidirectional blast of information towards people. It's got to be a debate. It's got to be a con conversation. And, and that, that, that's something that holds true in any community con consultation. It can't just be about information giving. It's got to be about listening as well. Absolutely. Um, and I'd like to go on to sort of also who are we listening to? And today is gender day. Um, so I'd really like to ask the panel, what measures will help mainstream gender and other considerations of diversity uh, that have been undertaken into the deployment of renewable energy? So I wonder, I'm gonna have to ask you first, Zoiza, aren't I? <laughs> 
being the only woman on the panel yeah um we could ask the octopus <laughs> yeah exactly um and that you know that that's got to change I think um we um we very often um do end up in a situation where um we talk about gender equality and there'll be one person on the panel however um I think uh, looking forward to how we engage differently and I'll there was a bit of a pet hate coming into this um, panel, I have to say, not, not just the fact that everybody was well, practically male, it was great to have another female moderator, but because we use this word engaging local communities, and I don't actually believe that community has to be just local, because um, I think to create the changes that we need, um, we have to look beyond that, and it can be anything, it can be uniting people with a common passion, so I think of our EV drivers at the moment um, that we work with and we supply energy to, and they're taking um, part in um, a trial called Powerloop, where they're using these um, batteries in cars, which can store enough energy to power a home for two to three days to help basically solve problems with intermittency that things like wind, wind farms produce. Um, so we can make the energy supply much more, um, much more um, consistent. Um, we have um, probably one of our most active communities um, outside of things like the fan club that I was talking about um, are things like our agile users group, which again, um, I think we had 30,000 of them joining together um, to actually balance the grid during um, one of the bank holidays um, when we were in the pandemic last year, where the grid was awash with green electrons. And actually by sending them prime signals um, we help balance the grid so that we weren't losing money in expensive curtailments and things like that so um, I, I think you know really in terms of making things way more diverse we've got to um, we've got to look beyond just what we traditionally um, defined I guess as people that were important to create wind farms um, and um, we've got to we've got to use all of these kind of modern day tools that we have now like um, creating digital com creating digital communities and things actually that resonate with people that are going to bring together young people that are going to bring together more women that are going to bring together more diverse people as well yeah thanks and I, I wanted to ask you Chibese I mean you work with young people uh what's your experience about how we can really better engage young people in some of these debates and and I think maybe it connects back to that question that both Gable and Neil were raising earlier about do young people see a career in renewables, do they see their green skills as something that will offer them an exciting future? Absolutely, uh, very absolutely. I, I think that um, young people matter uh, in this conversation. Um, in fact, I've heard people, some of them say that they're not the future leaders, but they're the leaders of today. Um, so they must be involved in the decision-making process. Now, one, there's no doubt that when it comes to the global population, young people, you know, are more, you know, if you look at the, uh, the numbers as compared to the older generation. And therefore they have a key role to play in the decision making process. From my point of view, or if you if want in my little experience from Ghana, based on our level of activism in Ghana now, we are being involved in our climate actions and renewable energy development sector. Uh, when it comes to the development of our national ad adaptation plan and our recently, and also the recent effort to enhance our NDCs. In fact, for the first time, if you look at Ghana's indices, the youth has been mentioned about five times, and there are clear indications to promote youth development. You know, youth. Mm, you know, congratulations. Uh, uh, when it comes That's to your work. Our yeah, so so we, we are demonstrating that you know young people matter. And let me conclude by saying that we are not only calling for climate action or putting pressure on government or the private sector to create jobs, but we are also saying that create the enabling environment for the youth themselves who also have their own creativity, innovation, to also create their own businesses. That's all we, we are asking for. So because of that, we have about six young people who we are promoting. They are green young entrepreneurs with their own businesses that they are promoting. Some are using waste into energy. So these are, are ideas that the youth are pushing to show that, okay, we are not only speaking in terms of advocacy, we are, we are also showing that we also want to be part of creating the employment that we need. And one basic line we always see, or we always choose to focus on is that government alone cannot solve the only problem situation. It's not possible. So we don't want to be left or moved by the political jargon that we are creating a job for the youth. The youth also must be allowed to create their own jobs and also employ other youth. And that's the same way we become collaborators in solving the unemployment situation in Ghana, Africa, and the world as a whole. 
Mm. Uh, and that puts me in mind, Jabezi, what you were saying there of a brilliant organization we know at Ashton called BVT uh, in India. And um, they've actually trained bankers so that bankers are much more open to renewable energy entrepreneurs coming to them because otherwise they'd say, oh, go away, you'll never make money from this, I'm not gonna lend it to you. So they went all the way back and realized what they needed to do was train the bankers so that when in particular women entrepreneurs came to them and said, I want to do textiles, but with solar energy, they were ready to lend to them. And that's led to thousands of women setting up small and medium sized businesses powered by solar, thanks to the banks being open to them. But moving on to the next question, and please do keep the questions coming online or stick your hand up. And this is from Santi from Spain. And I was wondering, Gabriel, if you could answer her, because she's asking, uh, or he, sorry, what do people um, in developed countries, there are people who don't want a wind farm near their cities or villages they, because of the visual impact. So they're in favor of renewables in general, but not when it's in their backyard. How, how to cope with that situation? So <laughs> that's, that's a good situation or a good question because, you know, uh, just in, in, in our country, in Austria, we have more or less the same situation here. So uh, we have uh, uh, the Western part here, of course, it's, it's also due to the, the top, uh, topology. It's maybe not the, 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 the best the best place for, for, uh, for, for the turbines. Uh, in the Eastern part, of course, we have a lot of turbines here in Austria. So. Uh, uh, I think it's, uh, as I said before, I think it's a kind of information. What, uh, what kind of uh, challenges we have or what kind of opportunities we have also with uh, wind turbines. So, of course, it should be not in my garden, but on the other, on the other side, of course, we have, to, we have to develop such kind of, of uh, renewable energy anyway. And uh, I think we have to find a, a, a balance uh, in, in several areas where we can see, okay, it's it's uh, it's possible to to uh, set up a turbine for, for on the one side, or, or maybe as I, I talked about before, we have to think about more these uh, virtual uh, plants, for instance. Uh, for 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 instance, uh, yeah, here in our area, we have more hydropower, and of course, uh, some people will say, "Oh, please, uh, yes, we need uh, we need energy, but not in hydropower." Uh, so we have to find uh, a solution for that. And in my opinion, it's, it's as I said before, it's kind of information and uh, special, of course, uh, for, for the politics. And it's also maybe a, a task or a, a challenge for us, like, like us as a company, as a technologi uh, technological company, to, uh, to provide all the jobs for such kind of, of, of people to see, okay, it's... it's uh, it's an upgrade maybe also for, for your life balance. Mm. Talking about uh, difficult decisions, I want to move to another one where we talk a lot about stakeholder expectations of companies and this idea as if there's just one group, but often there are different groups of stakeholders, including in within communities who have differing expectations. So how to cope with situations like that? Uh, I don't know who who's experienced that kind of work and would like to answer the difficulty of balancing different stakeholders who maybe have different expectations. I'm Anybody? happy to come in there, Harriet. Great, go for it, Neil. Thank go you. For it. Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned kind of earlier on um, in this panel, the stakeholders do come with, with very different issues. Sometimes it's about environment, sometimes it's about amenity, sometimes it's about it's about economic impact. Um, it, in, in terms of expectations and, and what developers can do, I think the, the, the best thing is that developers can should listen and react. Um, Gabriel talked there about, about providing information about prospective wind farms in, in communities where they're being developed. And, and, and absolutely, that, that's a big part of, of the issue. Early on in the process, this is what we're planning to do. This is where we're planning to do it. This is when we're planning to do it. So people have got an expectation about, about what's coming. But, but at, where I've seen much more success is where the developer engages in uh, and listens and reacts. So, uh, for example, allow the community to have some input into the design of the project. Now, of course, 
the developer has got a, a, an engineering or technical team that, that that's got to design this that, that this installation um but that's within sort of you know gui guidelines if you like um if if the community wants to see a particular way that the layout is laid the, the wind farm is laid out then then that can be accommodated to an extent and very often the stakeholders will react very positively to that because they feel like they've had an influence and at, at the end of the day that's very often you know a big part of the solution is to people to feel that they've been listened to and that they've had an influence that they have some agency in the discussion that they're not just on the receiving end yeah. um so in terms of expectations on on both sides i think i think that should be key to it mm. and i'd be really interested if, if if any of you have examples where a company really changed what it was doing because of the customer fix the, the community feedback uh because I think that would be the key, or decided not to go somewhere because people didn't want them, but did go somewhere else. But first, I wanted to actually bring you in, Zoiza, because another of the communities is, in fact, consumers. Um, and so how can we really, uh, how can energy suppliers really encourage positive consumer engagement so that there's a real impact on the green energy transition because consumers are actually calling for it? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I've, I've talked a little bit about uh, about that uh, with things like um, our customers actually being the ones that are driving um, our greenfield development pipeline. Um, what we see from them, I mean, we we see this, as I said, we're now working with millions of them, is actually um, this kind of mentality of walking into communities and building industrial sized wind farms where actually they don't benefit from them, they don't own them, they don't take the energy directly from them. It isn't going in the direction that we need it to. Actually, what they want is sympathetically planned, is smaller, is electrons traveling shorter distances down local grid networks, which aren't going one end of the country from Scotland to Bournemouth to powerhouse, but are going kind of in shorter distances where we can drive down the cost of energy, where we don't have single wholesale energy prices, but we have regional price signals that recognize proper decentralized systems where you have a one wind farm on the corner of the village and actually you get an, you get a cheaper energy cost because actually it's traveling a shorter distance. That's what we see from consumers. They don't want to take that energy, use it in their homes. They want to store it in those car batteries. They want to be able to then power their homes when they need to or return it to the grid if the grid is struggling. They want to be able to react and be engaged. Um, and we've had some wonderful examples of this just from even the first couple of turbines that we have where we've really gamified the experience where um, we've even lit them up and turned them green to show people, do your washing now, charge your car now because you're going to get a cheap price. And the reaction to those types of things is really awesome. It, it really has been. I really love what you said about smaller uh, generation as well. Uh, and there's a brilliant organization in Bangladesh called MISOLSHARE who have um, got a system where if I can afford a solar panel on my house, but you can't, I can sell my energy to you. And then if Joyce wants to run a fridge in her local shop to sell cold drinks, she buys even more energy for me. And then you create these networks buying uh, energy from each other. And in the end, you could then connect villages with villages and and finally feed into the grid if you needed to, but really keeping it local. So I'm afraid um, it's now time to ask each of the panel for their closing thoughts. So you're, I'm glad to say you've um, suddenly been called up. You're in front of the key negotiators at COP, and they've asked you for what is the one thing that you want them to do to engage communities in renewable energy. What are you going to say? Um, who's, who's going next? Uh, Gabriel. <laughs> So, uh, uh, so in my opinion, I, I have a, maybe I can, can can change this this question a little bit. I have a I have a kind of wish. <laughs> so I, I I would like to see the clean energy transition again at the same importance as the COVID pandemic in the last two years. So we know a lot of consultants and experts have been asked about their opinions and recommendation here on a daily basis in in intensive discussion and. Uh, I think we need this type of discussion, which leads the policy, uh, the policy development and decisions. And if we compare this to the approach in the energy policy, we are still at the very beginning of such a process and have, yeah, have, have yet to make a lot of pro progress. Yeah, I think it shows it, uh, us what's possible, doesn't it? Yeah. So, yeah. I, so I think if we have, or if we will, uh, 
take the targets of decarbonization seriously and also the dangers of not meeting the targets are clear, then the politicians are, must be prepared to work even more intensively uh, on solution with experts in renewable energies. And actually, that's a brilliant example, because in response to COVID, uh, we were able to move very fast to use existing institutions like the health service. And at the same time, communities felt part of it. Communities were completely engaged yeah. and they didn't know anything about the science before, but actually they were also rallied around caring for each other. Mm. So I guess there's something in there that what can we learn from that? On the downside, on the other hand, the response to the COVID has been completely unjust at a global level. Uh, that we're here is sitting in the UK but about to all get booster jabs when there are many people right across the world who haven't even had a first one. So we'd have to make sure we didn't replicate that in bit of the injustice. But okay, moving on, Chibize, so there you are, you're in front of the big negotiators. What are you asking for? So um, stakeholder consultation is non-negotiable if we want to promote renewable energy, if we want to sustain our interventions. And again, usually we classify them as vulnerable groups, but it can also be a very strong force to reckon with. So not only must they be seen in that regard, but let's see them as useful um, individuals who can support some of these interventions. And then also, uh, one thing that must also be noted when it comes to community people is that as long as their source of livelihood will not be touched, as long as we can give them a better source of livelihood, then they are likely to open up to some to, to the conversation or discussions. And one final recommendation or appeal I will make is that the consultation process must, must not be a one-off situation. It must be periodic and get feedback continuously from the, from the community people to be able to address some of the issues and take corrective actions where necessary. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, that constant feedback is absolutely critical. It's not a one-off, brilliant point. Neil? I'm, my main message was, is to be brave and don't be frightened of selling and promoting deep and fundamental change to society because that's what's required to shift. And as, as communities, as stakeholders, we're all stakeholders in this, we, we need to address the big changes that are required and, and government has got a huge amount of leadership to, uh, on its shoulders there. Zoiza, over to you. I'll go very quickly, make it simple. Um, it would be simply listen to people, um, not corporate lobbies, not um, organizations. Listen to what people are saying, because actually, I think if we said here, um, the biggest enabler in the world, they'll also be the biggest blocker. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much. I love the fact we're ending on be bold, listen to people uh, so we can take them with us. I'd like to say huge thanks to Joyce and the whole team at the Global Wind Energy Council for organizing today's discussion. Thank you to our fantastic panel from around the world. And thank you to all of you here in the room. <laughs> <laughs>